Pritchard, and this is still uh, statistical retanking. We're in week three now. Uh, what I've tried to do in the previous two weeks is give you the introduction to probability theory and how we use it to do uh, Bayesian data analysis. Uh, this week will be light on new tools and heavy on applications and concepts. So let's step back from stats for a moment and think about waffles. Uh, so uh, in North America, uh, there is a very famous chain of waffle restaurants called Waffle House. Uh, how many people here have ever visited this waffle house? Oh, excellent. It's just you. There's also a waffle house in Frankfurt. Do not go to it. <laughs> it is a crime against waffles. <laughs> but uh, Waffle House in North America is excellent. I highly recommend it if you're visiting. Uh, it's mainly located in the southern states. It is always open. Uh, this is one of the things about it that's very reliable. It doesn't matter what time of day, <laughs> uh, it will be there. Uh, indeed, it is so reliable that um, the United States uh, Federal Emergency uh, Management Agency has, uses internally something called the Waffle House Index uh, to index how bad a natural disaster is. Uh, this is a, the creation of this fellow here, Craig uh, Fugate, I think is how his last name is pronounced, who was director from 2009 to 2017. Uh, and he had established an index within the agency that they used whether Waffle Houses were open or not as an index of how bad the human experience of a storm had been. And this is really used uh, still in the United States. Um, so the quote from him, if you get there and the Waffle House is closed, that's really bad. <laughs> that's when you go to work. Um, so the, this is the internal scale. I'm not kidding you. This, by the way, this is the Waffle House after a hurricane. <laughs> um, that one's closed. Uh, they're not serving waffles. Uh, green, the green storm rating means that there's a full menu. Um, and waffle houses, by the way, have their own electrical generators. This is why they can stay open when the electrical grid falls out. You can still get your hot waffles uh, after a hurricane. Uh, yellow, there's a limited menu. There's no power, only limited power from the waffle house generator, and food supplies may be low. Uh, so, uh, and red is the restaurant is closed. That is the and this turns out to be better than wind speed and rainfall because it, it's the human level. It's what the facilities do. And so this has become a serious index of, of things. Um, uh, Waffle House is mainly located in the southern uh, parts of the United States just for historical reasons, uh, probably, where there are lots of hurricane impacts. And so this is why it's useful as an index. Lots of other things are also associated with the, the region of the southern United States. Uh, the North Americans here will know this, and those of you who are North Americans, you will have a rich set of stereotypes uh, drawn. <laughs> um, I uh, went to high school and college in the southern United States and have a lot of affection for it, I have to say. So I will make jokes about it, but I do it as an insider. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the things that the South is also known for, in addition to waffles, is divorce. Uh, divorce is a southern institution. Uh, the United States, the highest rates of divorce in the United States are in the southern uh, states. Um, and it turns out that one of the best predictors of divorce rate by state is the number of Waffle Houses uh, per person. Uh, why do I bring this up? Well, it's funny, uh, first of all. And secondly, it illustrates a common hazard in statistical modeling is that everything's correlated. Uh, so if we use correlations as clues of causation, which we do, let's face it, that's, that's what we do in science quite often, uh, you're likely to make bad inferences. And one of the things we ask statistical methodology to do for us is to um, guard us against casual correlational inferences like this. It's probably not true, I assert, but I cannot prove, that Waffle House is not causing divorce. Uh, nevertheless, if you put up the scatter plot like this, and then I've, I've done the regression, uh, not only is there, this is a Bayesian regression, so it sounds very sciencey, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is extra sciencey, it's just an ordinary regression, or whatever. And uh, uh, although there's a lot of uncertainty there, uh, there's a, there's a pretty uh, meaningful correlation uh, between the number of Waffle Houses per person and the divorce rate in each state. What's going on? Uh, well, plausibly, there's some other set of background variables that are associated with both of these things. They, their correlation arises, as we say, spuriously. It's, it, it's an accident of some other set of variables that's driving them both. Um, and uh, uh, things about the southern United States that that they can have high divorce rate are, uh, uh, the sociological literature says, uh, people get married earlier. And one of the best predictions of dissolution of marriage is the age of which people get married. 15-year-olds uh, uh, tend to make bad marriages. 
that's <laughs> what the literature says. Uh, and and uh, uh, cohabitating outside of marriage inside the United States is still frowned upon, uh, much more so than other parts of the U.S. So this is what the literature says about why the divorce rate is higher in the South. Um, and Waffle House just started in the South. The guy who founded it was a Southerner. I think it started in Georgia. I think that's right. And uh, certainly the greatest concentration are in Georgia, uh, which is where I went to college. Um, uh, so as an example of spurious correlation, of course, lots of things. Divorce is a good, a good uh, variable to look for because it's correlated with damn near everything that's related to people uh, because it's driven by demographic forces and a lot of them. So it ends up having high correlations with tons of stuff. And in a time series, you can find correlations with time series are great for finding correlations. Okay? There's, just, there's some uh, classic statistical result that Correlate, as a time series gets longer, it's bound to uh, illustrate some spurious correlation. Uh, there's a great website, which I encourage you to browse, uh, the Spurious Correlations website, which has a hilarious collection of these. It's one of my favorites. The divorce rate in Maine correlates very nicely, I must say, with the per capita of the apartment as well. Now, why? Well, these things are both related to demography and probably the age distribution of people in the state. Uh, and so correlations like this can arise from all kinds of things which are not giving you any clue about what causes divorce. Uh, it's not related to Marjorie consumption, right? Maybe Marjorie consumption is related, but related, caused by divorce, right? one of the two. But uh, still, this is, uh, this is a hazardous thing, and it's easy to find examples which are obviously spurious. The problem is that lots of things are not obviously spurious, but really are. And that is the terror, as I said uh, on the title slide, that it highlighted the causal terror of trying to do scientific inference is that it's very difficult to tell from data alone uh, whether a correlation it indicates some causal connection or uh, is instead merely spurious. So this week, I want to take all the tools from last week and tour through uh, the causal terrors for you. Uh, the first part will build you up. We'll talk about all the great things that regression can do to guard against spurious, uh, inference of spurious correlations. Um, so this is what I call, uh, we're going to, carry forward with the Gaussian model from last week, but we're going to add multiple predictor variables. And these are often called multivariate <laughs> linear models. Uh, the good things about these models is they can help protect you against the most casual forms of spurious associations. Um, they can reveal spurious correlation, and uh, not only that, but there are cases where there are actual causal relationships between things, and you can't detect them or see them unless you have more than one predictor variable in the model because causes are in conflict in, in natural systems, and they mask one another. So I want to show you um, how to uncover mask associations in such, such systems. Uh, then we're going to tour the bad, and this may be, maybe we'll start this today, but we'll definitely spend Friday uh, all on the bad. And then you can go off to the weekend depressed. And, uh, <laughs> and then you come back next week, and I'll build you back up again. But uh, you're welcome. Uh, but, uh, no, you need, to, you need to know this, and, and I think uh, I'm going to focus on cases where Adding predictor variables causes spurious correlation. It is not harmless to just add stuff to a model and actually totally distort your inference. Um, and this, I'll give you some examples of this. Uh, and in addition, it can hide real association as a consequence. Um, I'm very sensitive to this issue because uh, I think there are lots of professional pressures to exaggerate the power of statistical methods. Uh, so it's my responsibility to deflate uh, some of this and caution you about the dangers as well. And that isn't to say that doing inference without statistics is better. That's also that's also terrible. <laughs> uh, but it's just that statistics doesn't settle the argument, and there are lots of dangers to be aware of. But at least you have a structured analytical system that you can actually clearly communicate what you've done. That's that's an achievement. But it doesn't solve the problem. It solves communication problems and calculation problems but it doesn't solve the inference problem necessarily. Um, nothing does that necessarily, unfortunately. So I, the universe is hostile to human life. That's my message, the central message of the universe. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so with that, um, but at least we have waffles, right? So that's the upside. Uh, so what is spurious association? Uh, here's the background. Uh, you've all heard that correlation does not imply causation. Uh, the word imply there is the logical meaning, like in a philosophy course doing truth tables. That means it, it does not always indicate. Right? So you can't, it's a one directional area, arrow implied. Um, that is, you can have correlation without cause, uh, without a causal link between the variables. But it's also true the other direction. Causation doesn't even imply correlation. 
Uh, and uh, you can have variables that are causally related, but if you look at their correlation, it could be zero. Uh, what's a simple example? Uh, I won't spend much time on this, but a simple example would be, say you have a machine, and you input into it positive and negative numbers, say two, minus two, four, minus four, and it outputs the square of the input. There will be zero correlation between the inputs and the outputs, but, but they're, the input is perfectly determining of the output. They're definitely causally related, but there's zero correlation. It's easy to build possible machines like that. Uh, and in complex systems, this is what the whole Santa Fe Institute is about, in complex systems, this sort of thing happens frighteningly often. That there are highly nonlinear and delayed feedbacks and all sorts of things, and natural systems, causally related variables may exhibit no correlation. Uh, unless you look at them in exactly the right way, revealed by a model of how the system works. So that's why you need theory. Uh, so, um, causation implies some kind of association, though, but it may be complex. It might be nonlinear. It depends upon having some model of the system that you can lean on so that you know what kind of association to look for. There may not be a correlation. Uh, so, again, now you expect me to say this because I'm a theorist. I'm always telling people they need models, but I'm guilty, right? Uh, 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 so let's let's tour through this with the simplest kinds of linear associations uh, with some modeling of uh, divorce rate. And let's look at data from uh, North America uh, because following on the Waffle House example, I, you could do the same thing with Europe, uh, with, the, with the regional uh, states of Europe. And uh, let's look at relationships, uh, think variables that, that are plausibly causally related to divorce rates. In different regions. So the first one, of course, to think about is the marriage rate. Uh, we've asked a simple question, does marriage cause divorce? Well, that's an interesting question, right? In the obvious sense, yes. <laughs> no one ever gets married, no one can get divorced. Right? But beyond that isn't what, we're, what we mean. Beyond that, though, does variation in marriage rate affect variation in divorce rate? And it's not necessarily. It depends upon some subtle set of models. And just we're going to look at this today with linear regressions. Uh, but I want you to keep in mind that a satisfying analysis of this would start with some demographic idea. Think like, well, what's the mechanism by which we mean this happen? And what's a better way to look at the data? Okay, but I want to teach you full regression without getting down into the weeds of my particular uh, age structure demographic model of divorce, right? Some other time. Uh, I need to hear some time. I'll tell you all about it. But uh, so let's look at two potential explanatory variables for divorce rate in, in the uh, states of the United States. So divorce uh, is positively associated with marriage rate across the states. That's what you're looking at on the left. Right? This is a simple binary linear regression of the sort you saw last week. Um, and uh, uh, on the right, instead, we have um, a bivariate um, uh, regression between the median age of marriage in each state and the divorce rate. So now there's a strong negative relationship. So let's think about what that means now. So states in which people tend to get married later have lower divorce rates. This is the result I hinted at before. And this is very strong negative correlation. You know, this is the thing in the sociology literature people think is, is the most powerful driving force about why the southern United States have. So again, this is true in Europe too. If you look in Europe, you get the same kind of relationships. Catholicism is a, is a moderating variable. Uh, right? Not surprising to people, but not so much anymore as it used to be. Right? Um, so how do we get both those things in the same model, though? And we need to do that because the first thing you ask is, which of these is really driving force, right? Um, that's a complicated question, but it's a good one, and we want to start there. And what would happen if we put them both in? Uh, what does that mean? So what we really want to know, uh, or rather, what multivariate linear regressions answer are questions of the sort. What is the value of a predictor once we know the other predictors? That is, uh, let me flip back through the slide. Um, once you know a state's marriage rate, is there any additional predicted power in learning the median age of marriage? And vice versa. Once you know the state of Alabama's median age of marriage, is there any additional predicted leverage you could get by also learning the, the marriage rate? That's what linear regressions do, is they do that comparison. They do both, both directions simultaneously. And that's what the coefficients are giving you answers to. Is the, marginal additional value of each predictor once you know all the others. Uh, they'll be, they may not make sense right away, but we'll have lots of examples of what's going on here. Uh, so, it, and that's a very powerful thing. Again, it's, this is the kind of thing computers are good at, uh, and we're not. Uh, computers are bad at things like walking 
and recognizing birds and photos, things that we find trivial, uh, but they're really good at simultaneous comparisons between infinite sets of predictor coefficients. That's, that's easy for them. So uh, we will lean on this robot to do this for us. And then we will have to interpret the output, and we'll spend a lot of time today interpreting. So we're going to ask the two questions this is our first multivariate regression is going to ask. What is the value of knowing marriage rate once we already know median age of marriage? What is the value of knowing median age of marriage once we know the marriage rate? So here's what the regression model looks like on the bottom of the slide. D sub i is the divorce rate in state i. We're going to make that normally distributed because everything in the class is normally distributed right now. Later on, we can revisit this assumption. Um, but again, what does that mean? All this means is we're saying it has there's some set of measures and they have finite variance. Uh, if we knew nothing else about them, we'll assign them a Gaussian distribution, and that's a very conservative way to model their error. That's, that's the, the limit of the of, that's the strongest assumption uh, there. It's a very weak assumption. We could do better if we knew more about these measures. Um, so now we model them with a mean and a, and a, and a standard deviation. The, the mean in each state i is the expected value in each state i. It's going to come from a model, and there's going to be some uh, constant standard deviation across states. Uh, and the mean in each state i is given by this linear equation. Uh, some intercept, yeah, uh, plus a term for um, the rate of marriage. Uh, R sub i is the rate of marriage in state i. And the median age of marriage a sub i. So you just keep adding terms. Yeah. Now most of you are familiar with, with ANOVAs and things like that, so you've seen these sorts of equations before. Yeah. So this is this is why these models are called linear, because this predictor is linear. Okay, so let's uh, figure out what this means. So th what this sort of equation does is it let, it asks the equations uh, the question above. When you see that kind of model, you want to see it as asking the question uh, that's above it, the set of questions. All right, so let's tour through this thing in the pieces. Uh, so as I said, D sub i is the divorce rate, um, R sub i is the marriage rate, A sub i is the median age of marriage in each state, and then we have these parameters, these unobservable things that we have to infer. We're going to have posterior distributions for them. The so-called slope for marriage rate and the so-called slope for median age of marriage. And both of these parameters give you per unit change in the variables next to them. Uh, that is the amount, that each of those betas is the amount that the outcome increases. So if uh, R sub i, the marriage rate, increases by one unit in a state, then uh, the model expects D sub i to increase by beta sub r. Yeah, and likewise for age of marriage. I know this is super boring, but this is these are machines, so this is how they do stuff, right? And this is their program, so this is how they do it. Uh, so there's a lot of assumptions built into this, but it, it makes them ask the question on the previous slide. So we need priors. Uh, you always need priors. Um, and uh, uh, I assign here our sort of standard bang regularizing priors, and, and um, I, I beg your indulgence that next week we'll, we'll talk about priors a lot more and why uh, we don't want to have super flat priors, uh, things that are, again, are a little bit conservative. The threat is that looms here is overfitting, and we'll talk about this next week is all about overfitting, which is endless overfitting. Uh, so uh, one way you want to think about the intercept is, as I said before, the, the horoscopic priors, you want to let it swing. Let the slopes determine where the intercept is, right? Unless you have some theory about where the intercept should be. Sometimes you do, uh, but not in this case, right? Um, and then we put these uh, uh, priors on the coefficients so that they're skeptical of really big effects. Uh, this guards us against being tricked by our sample. We'll talk about this a lot this week. Uh, and then the standard deviation, just some flat range we'll get to. We, we can worry about overfitting on, on sigma as well when we get to uh, uh, later on in the course. OK, translate this into code on the right. This is the sort of things you were, you were you're doing in your homework that you'll turn in on Friday. Uh, and it, uh, you, did last week in lecture. Uh, there's a variable called divorce in the data set. We give it a normal distribution with mu and sigma. And remember, those um, those symbols mu and sigma are arbitrary. You pick the names, but if you use mu and sigma, people will understand you. <laughs> That's the only, the only value. I don't know why Greek letters have survived in math so well <laughs> uh, like this. Um, 
and uh, then you write your linear equation for mu, and these, these things can start to get quite long, especially if you have long variable names, uh, which I often recommend, long descriptive variable names, right? Text is free, just type it in your computer, it'll take it all, you won't complain. Um, so A plus BR times Bears dot S. Uh, when you read the text, you'll see the dot S has come from standardizing these variables, which is a very important thing to do. Please read the text to get, get my sermon about the importance of standardizing variables again. Um, I think we did some of this at the end of uh, last week, right? Um, and then BA times uh, the median age of marriage, standardized. And then the priors, which are just as they were on the previous. Okay, so we can fit this in map. Uh, it's very straightforward now. Uh, map. Um, executes the formula list. It really does. Map is just a wrapper that executes your formula list. You're programming your model and you're defining uh, the, the likelihood, uh, right? It's the product of the likelihood of the priors that goes into counting up all the ways that each combination of parameter values could produce the observed data. And then map does that. It finds, it climbs the hill, it finds the top part. Uh, so you can program lots of stuff in there and it will just as happily execute this as it would the other thing. This is more complicated now because you think we've got more parameters. So now, how many parameters do we have? Well, there's one, two, three, four, right? Parameters in this model. It's a four-dimensional posterior distribution. I think this is the first one that we've had that was. Now we had the parabolic model on Friday, didn't we? So that had four. Um, so now you can't visualize it. It's, it's a hypersphere, right? It's a four-dimensional sphere. And, uh, but that's okay, computers, again, computers are good at that. Four-dimensional sphere, no problem. Doesn't see you anyway. Right? It doesn't, doesn't get confused by trying to visualize it. It just represents it as a big array. And um, it can return the quadratic approximation of it, which I show you at the bottom here. Uh, so again, what are these? Uh, the mean column, this is the, the center of this four-dimensional hypersphere. Right? It's the point of, of uh, in the middle of the average, the peak of this four-dimensional Gaussian surface. Um, and then the standard deviation in each of the dimensions. What's missing here that tells you the whole shape of the posterior distribution are the covariances among these dimensions. Uh, you can get those out if you want them. And then in, I think it's in chapter four, I should have to do that somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so when you extract samples, that information gets used and the correlation structure is still preserved. Okay. So uh, it's reading those tables. Uh, now this is, this is going to be a lot of my opinion, and, and you may have different opinions, and that's fine. I respect uh, differences of opinion on these things. But my opinion is that tables of coefficients are really, uh, they struggle to be useful. Uh, they look really scientific. It kind of looks like science, right? You show it to your relatives sometimes and say, oh, you're a scientist now. You have tables of coefficients. Oh, that's really nice. And yeah, they're good for that. Uh, but I personally, and again, if you, if you get a lot from them, that's great. Uh, you're better than me then. Uh, I don't get a lot out of them. I have a hard time um, parsing them. Uh, I think what people get trained to do is they're really good at scanning table coefficients for, uh, for p-values less than 5%. That's what people are good at. They're very fast at that. And, but, but once, like me, you've deleted all the p-values, uh, these things cease to be tremendously useful. But, you know, I joke, but it's true, I think. I think it's what people do with table coefficients. But it's like, are any of these, you know, conventionally significant? Um, uh, there's a lot more information in there, of course, and that information is useful. And, but it's hard to get it out of just a table of numbers. So there are lots of ways to visualize these. An easy way is you can just plot uh, this, this pricey table uh, from my rethinking package, and it makes this kind of plot. But what do people call these things? Caterpillar plots, or what are they called? Uh, I think they have names, anyway. Caterpillar plot. Caterpillar. Okay. Caterpillar, uh, yeah. you know, something like that. <laughs> anyway. Uh, 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 Point and, and line segments. And uh, so what is it plotting? Uh, along the horizontal axis is just the value uh, of a variable. All the variables in the posterior distribution are then on the vertical axis, just one in each row. And then along, the, along that row, we plot the open circle for the map, for the mean of the quadratic approximation of the posterior distribution. And then the interval is the 89% interval that's from the table up there. So this lets you give you an idea of the location and precision of the estimate um, on the line. It's a quick way to do it. And uh, zero is highlighted here because for um, coefficients, like 
a slope, zero is a natural point of reference. If things are below zero, then uh, then as the variable increases, it reduces the outcome. And if it's above zero, then as the figure increases, it increases the outcome. So zero is a natural inflection point. But what you should not do is ask whether the thing overlaps zero, and then conclude if it does, there's no effect. Uh, the interval can overlap zero, and there could still be a very powerful effect of a predictor. Right? The zero is not special. It isn't like some magic that if the line touches zero, it annihilates the effect. Uh, there's nothing special about zero. Why not 0 0.1, right? It overlap 0 0.1, no effect. Right? Uh, uh, there's nothing. So don't do that. Zero is a natural inflection point. You can pay attention to it. But don't give in to the conventional superstition of thinking just because an interval touches zero that you should ignore that predictor. That's not true. Yeah, Katie. So how would you interpret something like that then? I mean, like, so you just talked about if it's yeah. below zero, it's negative, right? Negative, skew, whatever. That's a great question. So the question was, in case the microphone didn't pick it up, how would I interpret something like this? Uh, let me give you my spiel about this particular uh, uh, kind of set of effects. Let's ignore the intercept for a moment, because the intercept, like, whatever, it's over there. It's anchors the block, right? I mean, well, it's that's the divorce rate when, for a state where the marriage rate is zero and the median age of, of uh, marriage is zero. So it's meaningless in this model, right? It's off the graph. It's an impossible to have, right? So that's why we'll just take the first. It has no interpretable meaning. Um, what's that? Wasn't it standardized? Um, your variable? So oh, yeah. So for an average state. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, nobody points out that it says I standardized the predictors. It does have a meaning. So for an average, for a state with both average um, rate of marriage and average uh, median age of marriage, that's the divorce rate. So it's about a little over nine, something like that. Am I seeing it right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nine and a half, yeah, mm -hmm. something like that. So uh, but let's look at the coefficients, right? And let's think about uh, the coefficient on marriage rate for a second. It's slightly negative, and uh, uh, it overlaps. A lot of the probability mass in the posture distribution is above zero. Uh, more of it's below zero. So on, on the whole, uh, the evidence is that it has some small negative effect, a small relative to the other effect, right? Uh, uh, that's the way I interpret it. Uh, that's the evidence. So uh, if it has any effect, it's small, right? All the probability mass is near zero. Uh, that it's, it seems it's you know about one third chance that it's small and slightly positive, <laughs> and about two thirds chance that it's small and slightly negative. Either way, it's small. Uh, that's the way that I interpret it. But it's not zero, right? Now, it may be, as a, as a manager, you want to proceed as if it were zero. You think it's ignorable, and that may be true. Uh, but uh, it's easy to see uh, in cases, and we will later in this course, where those error bars are really wide. And the average effect is really far from zero, but it nevertheless overlaps zero. Does this make sense? It's not on the slide, so it's hard. I don't have an example that's on the slide right now. It's hard to see it. But you can get the map estimate. It could be really positive, uh, but the uncertainty could be really big, such that the interval overlaps zero. And what people do with p-values, then, is they say, oh, it's not significant. It doesn't matter. Uh, but it, it's just as much chance, according to the model, that the thing is bigger than the map estimate than it is smaller. Right? I'll say that again. According to the model, there's just as much chance that the effect is bigger than the map estimate than it is smaller, at least for a Gaussian model. And so it, it doesn't make sense to say just because zero is a possible value, we're going to act as if it's zero. That is a very poor decision-making process. Uh, so I should say, statisticians are unanimous about this. They're, we are routinely horrified <laughs> by the way people uh, do significance testing. But yeah, we lost control a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, uh, today I'm playing a statistician, but tomorrow I play a scientist. And, you know, there's a conflict of interest within my soul. <laughs> I just try to stay pure. Uh, uh, so uh, now the median age of marriage effect, this is a lot more negative, and um, uh, all the probability mass is below zero. And it's certainly uh, not a small effect. In fact, it, uh, there's almost no overlap between uh, those two. Uh, this to say, we shouldn't use the overlap between things to indicate their difference. There's a whole other distribution for the differences, and we'll do that later this later this week. Contrast effects. Psychologists know these very well, contrasts. Right? Look at the terror of computing contrasts. Um, and then standard deviation is not uh, something we're going to interpret a whole lot, but this is the amount of scatter around the line, right? The residual variance. Okay, unless you have predictions about that, you're not interested in it usually. 
Uh, okay, so let's try to summarize multivariate force. Let's go back to the interpreting the golem, right? Uh, one, one way I've often joked about this is to say that you get these tables of coefficients, maybe you plot them up, I recommend plotting them up. Uh, and think of this as like an interview with the golem. Uh, now the go you, you fed data to the golem and it's produced a posterior distribution, that's the answer, and I go, thanks. Yeah, this is what I wanted, uh, you know, a four-dimensional Gaussian hypersphere. Thanks, that's exactly what I wanted, <laughs> you know. And the golem doesn't get sarcasm, so it doesn't <laughs> respond very nicely to that. Uh, so then you have to patiently have an interview with this thing. And you take it into the interrogation room, <laughs> and uh, uh, you go to work. And what do you get out of this? Well, uh, after a few hours of sweat and pounding on the table, you can learn that what this, uh, what the goal thinks is that once you know the median age of marriage, there's little additional value in knowing the marriage rate. Yeah, and that's because uh, BR is close to zero, uh, and it seems it's it's there's a lot of mass on both sides of zero. And its effect relative to VA is small, uh, regardless. Uh, in contrast, once you know the marriage rate, um, you, there's still a lot of value in knowing the median age of marriage. You would really want to know. So another way to think about this, if you had some, if you had to build up some kind of what people call lexicographic rule, and you could only pick one piece of information to predict the state's uh, divorce rate, you would pick median age of marriage. Right? That would be the first one, and then. If you could know uh, uh, the uh, marriage rate, there'd be a tiny bit, maybe, of additional predictive leverage you could get, but almost not zero, right? Because the uncertainty is on both sides of zero, so you're really not even sure whether it should increase or decrease it. Uh, there may be some effect there, uh, but it's very hard to tell from these data. Uh, so, but keep in mind, if you didn't have access to the median age of marriage, there's a lot of information in marriage rate because these two predictors are correlated with one another, so they contain co-information. So if you're denied by some censorship, knowing access to the median age of marriage for a state, uh, go for the, uh, there is informational value in knowing the marriage rate, absolutely. And that was the graph I showed you at the start, right? Remember the bivariate scatter. And this is the thing why we say, now people say, oh, there's a spurious correlation between marriage rate and divorce rate, because once you control for median age of marriage, it's not very important. And that's an okay summary to say. Yeah? But that doesn't mean that learning marriage rate is of no value. It depends on what other information you have. Yeah. If prediction is your goal, you'll take what you can get. I mean, it's probably true that median age of marriage is also spurious. There are other things that are mediating effects that would not get out of the model. We'll talk about that later this week as well. Right? This is not actually the median age of marriage of the state that causes divorce. It's, it's the sands of the hourglass and the days of the lives of the people. <laughs> right? And that's what causes divorce. <laughs> and so those are the mediating variables. These are just Bureau of Census statistics uh, that are associated with one another and are, and are pale shadows of the actual events that are causing these things. Uh, all right, that's enough of my bad poetry. Uh, so uh, let's spend maybe the rest of the day um, just plotting the results from this model. Uh, this will be more exciting than it sounds, I hope. Uh, I think. Continuing the metaphor of the interview with the golem, uh, there are lots of different ways to go about interpreting the four-dimensional hypercube and what it means. And there's no single right way to do it. Uh, it depends upon the structure of the model and the meaning of the data, what you want to do. It also may depend upon you, uh, the observer, and, and your training or the uh, particular questions you're interested in. So let me give you some options. And as we go through the course, we will return to these options and use them in different cases. Um, and I want to be clear from the start, though, that uh, I'm not saying you have to do these things, uh, right? Uh, but they're, these are broadly useful, horoscopically useful sorts of things. Before I know what you're studying and what your model and data are, I can say, well, this is a nice suite of things that have recurrent use in the sciences. And so I want to offer them to you as part of my horoscopic advice. Uh, but in any particular case, if you come in, you know, come by my office and, and show me your data and model, I could probably give you better advice. At least I would try to. Uh, I may fail, but I will try, I promise. So, uh, four options to show you today. Um, first, I want to walk you through what are called predictor residual plots. Uh, this may be familiar to those of you who've had another course in regression. Um, and I'm going to show you how to construct these plots, uh, but 
this is also an attempt to also re-explain what just happened with the model and how the model goes about getting the answers it does. Uh, second uh, type of plot that I personally use a lot um, called counterfactual plots. They are a, a genre of fiction. They produce impossible graphs that can never exist in your natural system. And by doing so, they help you understand what the model thinks. Because uh, the model doesn't complain when you tell it to consider impossible cases. Only you will complain. And that helps you understand how the machine functions. So these counterfactual plots are really useful. Uh, you see them in journals a lot, too. People don't tend to follow this. Uh, they use the term counterfactual, so you keep in mind that these cases that you plug into the model and are visualizing cannot happen. <laughs> they are impossible things. right? Uh, number three, um, posterior prediction plots, where we're forcing the model to make new predictions, and you could view those predictions in any particular useful way, depending upon the nature of your system. These are useful for all sorts of things, including just checking whether the machine works. Uh, see if it makes sensible predictions of the data you see. Uh, uh, posterior, these are sometimes called posterior predictive checks. Uh, and I think <coughs> uh, you probably always do one of some kind, just to make sure that the model worked, <laughs> that the machine actually functioned, because sometimes it doesn't. And, uh, and then number four, it's not really an item, but you can invent your own. You should feel free, uh, since you are the expert on your system, uh, uh, to have some other way to visualize it. You don't have to go with convention. Okay, so our goal is to show the association of each predictor with the outcome, uh, controlling in quotes for the other predictors. Uh, let's see, we want to visualize how the golem sees it. Um, how do these beta coefficients uh, get their meanings inside the model? And this is very useful for getting some in intuition about how the model works. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to compute things called residuals, which are in some sense implied inside uh, the machinery but I would say you should never analyze residuals. Uh, and I, I have to say this because you see it in journals. Uh, I don't think I've, I've seen it in psychology journals very often, but in biology journals, it's quite common to analyze residuals. And this is a terrible practice. Uh, why? Because residuals lose the uncertainty around them. Residuals are parameters. Uh, and everything that is a parameter depends upon the posterior distribution and has uncertainties. There's a posterior distribution of the residuals. And when people just compute residuals and then treat them like data, they've thrown away all the uncertainty. You don't know the residuals. You have to infer them. They're not data. I'm sorry, I would get exercised about these things. But this is like rampant st uh, statistical malpractice in scientific journals. And uh, so it's a thing that, anyway, you'll get my rants about this over and over again. <laughs> but uh, or you don't know the residuals. They're not certain. And so if you treat them like data, you're throwing away a whole bunch of uncertainty, and you will mess up. <laughs> right? Um, it's my job as a grumpy statistical reviewer to say these things a lot uh, in reviews, and I do. But as you know, most papers never have any statistical reviewer, right? And so you see these things a lot. Um, anyway, I, I should say, now that I've done this rant, um, I don't blame scientists for doing these things. They do it because they were taught to, <laughs> right? Uh, often by the most successful scientists in their field. And so it's, it, instead, there's a vast impersonal conspiracy that is uh, scheming against us to make us do bad science. <laughs> and it's, I, I absolve individuals of guilt. Instead, we share a collective guilt for the dynamics of our society. And we should band together. Uh, uh, so uh, more on that theme later in the course. Uh, so uh, what's the recipe for building these particular residual plots? I'm going to walk through this on the slides to follow. First, we're going to regress um, each predictor on uh, the other predictor as if it was its own model now. Leave aside the outcome variable for a moment. Forget about it. Forget, in this case, divorce. Uh, now we've got median age of marriage and marriage rate. We're going to do a regression of each of those on the other. Uh, then for each of those regressions, you compute the predictor residuals. I'll tell you what those are and, and help you visualize that. Um, and then we're going to uh, regress the outcome on the residuals. And again, I, this you see, I'm going to do the thing I just say right above this not to do. We're going to analyze residuals, but I'm doing it just to make a graph, right? We're not making conclusions from this. The conclusions come from the multivariate regression in the first place, and that's what you should use. Uh, the computing the residuals this way is just a visualization technique. Don't then take the residuals and put them in another model, like I see in the journal Nature, uh, far too often, right? Uh, not to pick on Nature, but yeah, actually to pick on Nature. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think, I think it's, it's easier to do bad stats in higher impact factor journals than it is in, in medium impact factor journals. It's very
very hard to get bad stats into the American Naturalist. It's very easy to get them into Science and Nature. Uh, I, I think that's. I think there's data on that actually. <laughs> been surveys of that. It's the review process, right? Uh, so, okay. Predictor on predictor. Uh, we regress marriage rate on median age of marriage. Uh, so. This, there's nothing fancy about this model. You, you're getting comfortable with these models by now. This is just a, a linear regression between uh, marriage rate as the outcome and median age of marriage as the predictor. Nothing surprising? No? That's a question. Nothing surprising. Question mark. Good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what's a residual? A residual, residual is the distance of each outcome from the expectation. The expectation is mu in this model the expected value for each state. So we want to know the distance between uh, the expectation for each state according to the posterior distribution and the observed um, uh, value. And the outcome here means the outcome in this little model we just did, which in this case is fair trade. So here's the code. Uh, we compute mu for each state. And there's one line of code to do it in R. Mu is, you just take the coefficient out of the fit model in 5.4, and you want the component A, right? That's how you do it in R. Uh, and we want B times the median age of marriage in each state. And since median age of marriage in each state is a vector, mu ends up being a vector at the same point. So now you've got a mu for each state. Yeah? You guys love R, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Katie's not here. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> You would. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and then same thing goes for computing the residuals. Oh, sorry, I thought that this was on the next slide. Uh, computing the residuals, we take the marriage rate in each state and we subtract mu from it. So, marriage rate in each state is also a vector. Mu is a vector of the same length, so their difference is a vector of the same length, and that's what the residuals are. So, you get a residual for each state. Let's visualize what those things are. So, here is the regression between marriage rate and median age of marriage each of those points in the state, and the line is the map regression line, the maximum a posteriori regression line. Yeah, in this case, almost identical to the maximum likelihood regression line. Or if you just did OLS regression, there's a reason to do that. It looks almost identical to this. Uh, what are the residuals? Well, uh, if we draw a line, vertical line, from the regression line to each data point, the length of that line is a residual for each state. And that's all it is. Yeah? So that's all the, math, the code on the previous slide did. Uh, so let's zoom in here on a particular region. Uh, so, ooh, yeah, that worked. <laughs> so we can zoom in. It took me about 15 minutes to figure that out. So I'm glad that worked out. We zoom in uh, uh, on this region of the regression line. And so each of those blue points is a state, and the vertical lines from the regression line to them is the so called residual. It's the Say, prediction error, average prediction error. It's average because these residuals actually have a posterior distribution where we just plotted the map line, uh, but there's actually a bunch of lines, right? The posterior is full of lines, and so for each of the lines, there's a different residual implied. So there's actually a distribution of residuals for each state. Uh, but we're just looking at the expectation, we're going to draw a graph. Um, when you do the, when we did the model already, all that uncertainty about the residuals was taken into account. That's what the posterior distribution does. It was already in there. We're just drawing pictures now. So we're going to focus on the average for the picture, and that's fine, but, but this is not the analysis. Uh, so let's consider a couple of cases in, in the inset here. Uh, consider states below the regression line. For these states, the marriage rate in the state, the actual observed marriage rate in the state, is less than the expectation. So you might say that these states have a low rate of marriage for their median age of marriage. Yeah? This is, it's a weird thing to say, but think about it. So what are individuals in these states doing on average, or the typical individual in these states? Uh, they get married slower. <laughs> think about it that way. It's a rate. It's like a speed. Um, uh, for uh, typical states with that median age of marriage, the age at which people get married. Uh, so it's, it's implicitly a comparison to the whole set, because that's where the regression line comes from. Uh, states above the regression line, it's the opposite. They're, they're getting married fast uh, for, the for the expectation. So they have a high rate of marriage for their median age of marriage. Yeah? 
So other states with similar median age of marriage uh, are getting married slower than those states. Right? We've got error in both directions, but they're different kinds of cases. So the, the residuals give you information about the deviation, and it's a deviation, it's, it's directed, right? There's a sign to it, whether it's negative or positive. And that's the information we want, and that's the information the model uses uh, uh, to think about the additional information of knowing one variable once you know the other. So let me try to walk you through that. Now we ask this question, how is divorce associated with the residuals of marriage rate? So we're gonna plot that. As a plot, maybe it'll make more sense. Uh, so here's the thing we already saw, right? This is median age of marriage against marriage, uh, and then there's the regression line, and the, the vertical lines are the residuals. Above the line, we have states that are fast for their median age of marriage, and below, we have states that are slow for their median age of marriage. Yeah, this is what you just saw. Now let's take those um, residuals, the, the vertical lines on the plot on the left, and let's put them on um, the horizontal axis on the plot on the right. Let's take them as data points now. Again, this is for visualization. This is not the analysis. Right? Uh, and let's plot them against divorce rate to ask what the re what's the relationship. So there's, there's all this variation in... Um, uh, in marriage rate that was left over after we accounted for the association between marriage rate and median age of marriage. And that remaining association, varying variation, is embodied in the residuals, the right? so-called residual variance. Uh, so now we're plotting that residual variance, the positive and negative deviations, the fast states and the slow states, uh, against the divorce rate. Uh, and we're asking, what's the relationship now? Uh, and if there's any relationship, then that's the additional marginal value once you've taken the, the joint information uh, that is shared in these two variables out. Right? So well, we'll talk about this exactly the other direction again and come back to it, but this is how the model inside is getting the partialing out of the two. These are partial correlations, right? That's how it does it. But, um, so let's look at it then. Uh, on the graph on the right here, uh, marriage rate residuals are on the horizontal. They're centered at zero where I have that vertical dashed line. So to the left of the vertical dashed line, you have the slow states. Right? They get married slow for their median age of marriage. Right? We've already taken median age of marriage out of those values. All the joint information in them is gone. That's what the regression on the left is. But, well, joint information assuming a linear relationship. Right? The relationship may not be linear, right? Stay, always. But this is an assumption of your model. Uh, and, and states to the right um, of the vertical dashed line are fast. They get married fast for the median age of marriage. And now we... We plot those against the divorce rate, and we ask, is there any relationship? And the answer is, not much. Right? There's a very, very mild negative correlation uh, there. So there's not, this is what the model learned before. Once you've accounted for median age of marriage, there's not much variation left in marriage rate that informs divorce rate. I'll say that again. Once you've accounted for the association between median age of marriage and marriage rate, there's not much variation left in marriage rate that is associated with divorce rate. Just a little bit, it's slightly negative, like the regression coefficient we got before. Slightly negative, but it could plausibly be positive, and that's what the bow tie is showing you on the right. Yeah? Good? Yeah, at least enough to march forward. Let's do it the other way. I always like to do things both ways. So, uh, how is divorce associated with the very, so this is, what, this is my summary slide for before. Um, states with fast, slow rates of marriage, poor age of marriage, do not, on average, have fast, slow divorce rates. That's what this residual plot shows you. These residual plots are often great for helping readers visualize the coefficient and what it, the way the model sees that bivariate relationship between an individual predictor and the outcome. It sees it like this, at least in a purely linear model. In a nonlinear model, you can still compute residuals, but it's, it's more complicated. Uh, so let's do it, as I said, the other way. So think about it from both perspectives. There's two predictors. Uh, so we're going to go through each of the plots on this slide one at a time uh, so that uh, we can focus on one plot at a time and understand the whole gestalt of it. Uh, in the upper left first, we're looking at that regression between median age of marriage and marriage. So we're taking, uh, uh, we're seeing what variation is, is, what's the variation in marriage rate after we've accounted for the association with median age of marriage. And that's how we got the fast states and the slow states. This is what we just did. And then when we look at the um, residual predictor plot, 
we've got residuals against the outcome divorce rate, and we see that there's not much information left uh, once you've taken the median age of marriage information out. Marriage rate tells you very little. It tells you something, but very little. Now we do it the other direction, exactly the same procedure, but now we flip the regression that's in the upper left, and we've changed the axes. Now what was the outcome is the predictor, and what was the predictor is the outcome. Um, now we're taking, we take the information in marriage rate out of median age of marriage. Now there's residuals for median age of marriage. So above the regression line, we've got states where people get married older for their rate of marriage. So in any, there are a bunch of states, imagine, that have the same rate of marriage in the whole total population. But in some of those states, people are getting married older, and some of those states are getting married younger. And that's what this line is telling you. Above the line is the states where people tend to get married older, and below the line is where they tend to get married younger. Uh, and then we compute the residuals, those vertical lines, and we can plot those on the horizontal axis in the plot in the, in the lower right. Um, again, the vertical dashed line is the zero point. To the right of that, we have states that where, where people get married older for the rate of marriage in the state, and on the left, where people get married younger for the rate of marriage in the state. And we plot them against the divorce rate, and now we see that there's a lot of variation, uh, uh, a lot of association between these two variables, even after we've taken out the information about marriage rate. And this is what the multiple regression told you, of course. This is not, this is just visualizing what you saw before. And the slopes of those lines are the slopes that you had in the table before. Uh, it's the same information, but you're seeing it like the golem sees it. This is the interview with the golem, right? This is what you focus on a bivariate relationship, the way the machine sees it. Uh, does this make sense? Is this useful? Yeah? Um, I remembered when I was uh, uh, learning this stuff uh, uh, as an undergrad, I thought this was, this was useful, so that's why I put it in here. This is a very traditional presentation of multiple regression, um, uh, which is not, I don't tend to do traditional presentations. But I thought, you know, when they're useful, I'll do them, right? I'm not anti-traditionalist. Uh, so let's try to summarize. Uh, what we're doing here is often called statistical control. We're controlling for other predictors. And uh, I'll, I'll have, uh, now, I put control in quotes because, of course, control is from experimental design, where you really can control for things, or at least we hope so. Uh, in statistics, you don't really control for things. It's, it's a magical, um, counterfactual kind of control. It, it imports uh, experimental design language into model design, and so it's a bit naughty. Uh, but this is the standard uh, language. Um, so multiple linear regression answers the question, how is each predictor associated with the outcome once we know all the other predictors? It's just associations. It's not telling you causes. Causes depend upon external information. Right? So we'll, we'll problematize this a lot more this week. Um, it just uses the model to build the expected outcomes, which are the lines. It's not magic. It's all model-based. There's no direct, remember this is all small world. Uh, there's no direct access to reality here. Uh, that all comes from your large world beliefs and interpretations. Um, so don't get cocky. Uh, the marriage rate may still be associated with divorce for some subset of states, even if it's not for all the states, right? Uh, now this is not to encourage you to do subgroup analysis endlessly, looking for some particular <laughs> cluster of states in which there is a meaningful correlation. Uh, that sometimes happens, it's called p-hacking. Right, where you take your data set, you slice it up into a bunch of subgroups. And uh, if you've got a theory that motivates subgroup analysis, fine, you can justify it. But um, yeah, but you know, uh, when people's uh, uh, paychecks depend upon finding p values, they will find them. Right, and they have invented ways to do it. So uh, it's partly my, my job as a statistics educator to discourage you from doing things that only feed you. Uh, I want to <laughs> help you discover true things while you get fed. Right, that's my goal. So, um, so we can't make strong causal inferences, uh, especially in this case, because these are averages. And there are lots of hazards in doing regression on averages. And we'll talk about that later in the course. Uh, there are lots of potential fallacies that can arise from doing regressions like this. And so I'm setting myself up uh, to disprove my earlier lecture when we get uh, later on. We talked about Simpson's paradox in particular. Um, uh, averages can be related to one another even if uh, at the individual level, the variables are not related. It's, it's the fun fact about the world. Again, the universe is hostile to human life. That's, that's the achievement. You can feel proud that you've gotten out of bed every morning because the universe is against you. Right? You're a winner. <laughs> so, counterfactual plots. 
Uh, the goal in a counterfactual plot is uh, still to conduct the interview with the goal of, to see the implications of the model. Uh, but now we're not going to do it with in the residual space. We're going to do it on the actual measurement scales of the variables that we have them in the data set. So we're going to force the model to make predictions for any fictional sets of combinations of predictors we like. And we do this because it helps us understand what the model thinks. You can visualize the slopes and you can visualize later on interactions. So that'll be very important when we get to chapter seven when we talk about interactions. Uh, so let me introduce these now where they, they won't necessarily add a lot of information to you, but they'll help you see the slope and the magnitude of the slope on the natural scale of the data. Uh, so how do they work? Uh, you pick some predictor you're interested in. You want to view say, the bivariate relationship between marriage rate and divorce rate as implied by the model. So you fix the other predictors. You imagine some set of states that all have exactly the same median age of marriage, say the average here, we set it at zero. Which since it's a standardized variable, that means it's the average. Uh, and then we vary freely the median age of marriage, as if you could vary these things freely. But you can't, right? Not, not in a human animal, at least. <laughs> uh, if you manipulate one, if there's some intervention you would do to a state, they would change one of these things. I posit it will change the other. Right? This is why it's a counterfactual plot. You cannot, in a natural system, freely manipulate all the predictors. It's just not how it works. Uh, and uh, especially not in anthropology. Right? So, um, and, but in, in the machine, you can do this, and it's really useful for understanding what the model thinks. And then you can do predictions across some values of the predictors. So, um, uh, at the bottom here, two examples, we vary marriage rate, holding median age of marriage constant at the average, and you get to see uh, that's the slope. It's mildly negative. Uh, the darker bow tie in the middle is the uncertainty of the mean, of the expectation mu, and the lighter uh, bow tie is not too bowed, is it? Very slightly bowed uh, on the outside is the total prediction of that interval. At the 89% interval using sigma, uh, you, the whole scatter of states are expected to be within that region. And then on the right, same thing now, but for median age of marriage, we imagine a fictional <coughs> set of states that all have the same marriage rate, but they vary in median age of marriage, and then this is the this is what the model expects them to look like. Yeah? The model can do these things without complaining because it doesn't know the meaning of the variables, right? It, it's only your knowledge of the variables that's like, but wait, you can't make a state that freely varies these things. Well, yeah, but uh, this helps you understand what the model thinks, and that's very useful. You always know more than your model. Uh, so you have to assume, you have to drive here. Uh, so again, on the left, we change the marriage rate without changing the median age of marriage. What does the model think? Or we can change the median age of marriage without changing the marriage rate. Uh, last thing I have time for today is posterior predictions. I mean, this is a thing I think is, is nearly always useful, if for nothing else, than checking that the model worked, that it fit correctly. Uh, we're going to compute implied predictions for the observed cases. Uh, just to check back, what does uh, the model think about the cases that were used to train it? Right, and say it was trained it, the uh, posterior distribution was updated on the base of, basis of some set of, of cases that you fed it. We want to see what it thinks about those. And sometimes it thinks really dumb things about them if it's a really bad model. Uh, and the cases where it mismatches, the goal is not to get a perfect retrodiction of your sample, but rather to help it inspire you to think about which cases it is doing bad at, because that gives you a way forward to think about what's wrong. Uh, and often models will do a great job on the majority of cases and a terrible job on a few cases. And this uh, gives you some idea why. Uh, states have particular history. So we'll have an example here coming up in a second, so bear with me. Uh, so what, when you do this, you need to average over the posterior distribution always. We don't always use the map because that leads to overconfidence. You have to embrace the uncertainty that is embodied in the whole posterior distribution. Propagate it forward and communicate it in the graphs as best you can. We're going to do that here with intervals, but sometimes you can do it with distributions as well. So there's a function in rethinking called postcheck, which is designed for this. I wrote this for myself years ago because I like to do this with every model. This is just the did it fit <laughs> sort of thing. And I run the thing, and then you run postcheck, and it's it's an ugly graph. But bear with me. Like I said, it has to it, it's horoscopic. It has to work for everything map will fit. So uh, along the horizontal axis is each case, each row in the data, each little i index in the data. So here it's each state. And there are 50 of them. Yeah? And uh, then on the vertical axis is the outcome. 
So in each, uh, for each case, we've got a blue dot, which is the observed divorce rate. And then we've got an open dot, which is the model's expected value. That's the mean. And then there's a little line segment around the open dot, which is the uncertainty around mu for that case. And then um, the two pluses give you the full prediction interval. Right? And so you can, now you would say, how do you read this? Well, that, that depends upon you in the case and what the data means. Uh, sorry, that's just how it is. Uh, but the first thing I look at is, is it, is it getting even close? Right? Did it fit at all? And that's kind of the first check of it. Um, so you can see how it co varies around, right? Uh, the model is, it's uh, these sorts of regressions will nearly always get all the cases within the plus intervals because that's what sigma does. It just, it, the model expands sigma until it can get the majority of those. Uh, of, of the data points inside the envelope. So that, that, don't be comforted by that, right? It's, uh, it's really good at doing that. Um, the expectations are often more informative. And the misfits are uh, more informative than the places where it gets it exactly right. And there are some cases where it gets it exactly right. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, let me show you one last thing and then I'll let you go. Uh, looking at those predictions in different ways, the same posterior predictions, uh, uh, is, is often informative. So now we're looking at the observed divorce rates on the horizontal against the predicted on the vertical. And this um, diagonal dashed line is the line of equality. That's the cases where the model gets it exactly right. Uh, and it does get it almost exactly right for average states, right? for states in the middle, because that's what linear models do. They get the average cases right. That's what they're good at. Uh, the misfit cases here are easy to pick out. There are two states in particular where the model's doing a really, really bad job. They are Idaho and Utah. And those, uh, now the, the people who have spent some time in the United States are laughing because they know there is a particular feature of these states about their populations that is unique demographically and culturally that explains this result. What's going on with these states? Uh, these states, um, uh, the model expects them to have much higher divorce rates than they actually have. So these states have really low divorce rates for according to the model, for their median age of marriage and their marriage rates. What is up with these states? These states are heavily, they have a lot of people who are members of the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, the LDS Church, known as the Mormons. And the Mormon Church uh, is very good at enforcing the continuity of marriage. <laughs> Divorce is a very, very, very bad thing for the Mormon Church. Um, and the populate, these are the two states with the highest proportions of Mormons uh, in the states. And that is the thing that explains it. Right, and goes on. So, but you pick it out. The model didn't originally think you needed Mormons in it. Um, <laughs> but if you really want to explain all the states, you would want to put them in. Now, maybe you don't care about the relationship between being LDS and and divorce rate. Fine. Uh, but the idea would be you get a better estimate of the underlying relationship between median age of marriage and divorce rate if you accounted for this compound. Right? It's noise that is getting in the way. It it makes those states less informative than they would be. All right, with that, I, I apologize for holding you over for a few minutes. I uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you on Friday. We're asking people, why do you like Waffle House? You know what I really like best about a Waffle House? I can stop by here anytime, day or night, that I've been fishing and get good breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It doesn't matter what time I leave in the morning or what time I get done in the evening. I can come to a Waffle House. You know what I really like about it? When I end up in the doghouse, I can always come to Waffle House and get something to eat. <laughs>